organizer for the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, sponsored by the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And today I want to talk about specifically using quality improvement and developing the capability of the people who are engaged in spread to do improvement work. And I'd like to acknowledge the Institute for Healthcare Improvement for their lessons learned from Ghana's Project 5 Alive publication. So one of the most important things when you're starting a spread campaign is to be ambitious and follow through with your ambition. Ambitious in sense of the aim that you set, so it could be uh, about the reduction in mortality that you want to make related to sepsis, and the extent of spread. And a great thing to think about is to consider using a learning collaborative or a learning network as the vehicle to move your spread across the organization and to think of those as 12 to 18 month learning networks or learning collaboratives that are chunked in these 12 to 18 month periods but they're rolling over the extent of time it takes you to complete your spread project. So you've set your ambitious aims and you're following through by making sure that the aim is achieved in the pilot unit and then the changes that worked in the pilot unit are spread systemically unit to unit throughout the organization. In Ghana, uh, they learned that using increments of five is a good way to think of scaling up. So remember that you'll scale up from one unit to five units to 25 units to all, or 25 units um, to 125 units. So uh, you're, you'll be scaling up in increments of five to uncover systemic barriers as you go that if they're not removed will prevent successful spread strategy. So you've got your ambition and you're following through. One of the important things to do early in spread, and, and this happens in the pilot unit, but as each unit comes on, is to have early wins. Because if the first change that a team makes is successful, that builds confidence that they can shape their future, they can change the way things are done around here, and that will inspire them to continue the work. Another suggestion is to engage all of the people involved in delivering care in the unit and problem solving and testing, especially around intractable problems. What we want to avoid is having a cult of a few people that understand the vocabulary, language, and know-how of quality improvement. What we want is that a basic skill set is available to every single person that works on the unit and that they are actually brought into and drawn out into problem solving. So also important is looking at data all the time. So using data to understand, are we improving? How fast are we improving? Is this the pace we want to improve at? And as you start to spread, how well are the changes being adopted in spread units? Now when you start spreading, and even with a pilot unit, it's important for the pilot unit for leaders to make site visits. Now you might say, well, that's ridiculous to make a site unit to uh, visit to my own unit, but it isn't really. Going there and being visible and asking the team to prepare for your visit, asking staff to congregate so that you can engage them in questions and dialogue about the project shows your commitment. That's part of your follow through. Once you start spreading, it's important that the spread units make site visit to the pilot unit or what I would call the donor unit. So they come to that uh, site where the work was originally done, they shadow uh, people who are doing the work, they look at the processes that are in place so that they can begin to understand even before they start working on the changes how it might look on their unit. Um, we feel really strongly that you need to engage the whole team when you do these visits, not just a few people and create the expectation as you spread that everyone will be testing rigorously using the plan, do, study, act cycle. It's not just for a few team members. It's not just for a few changes. The secret is in the rigorous use of that scientific method made practical called plan, do, study, act. So when you're forming the team, you have to think about the pilot unit and then the spread units. So a core team is a really good idea. Those are the members that would attend the formal learning sessions or learning network meetings. That includes the day-to-day -day unit leader and the key 
uh, personnel related to improving the care. So those who are closest to the process, that would be a staff nurse, a pharmacist, and a provider. Then you'll have an expanded team that is a, a way to engage others, not only on the unit, but others that are needed to accomplish the results. So that means we have to think about who are they. Well, definitely you have to have pharmacy. We need the lab so we can get turn, quick turnaround on our tests. Rapid response team or whatever uh, vehicle you have for that. Your physicians and providers, somebody from the ER, the ICU, of course the nurses on the unit, respiratory therapy, ward clerks, and so on. So that would be the expanded team. You don't have the luxury of pulling the expanded team off of their day-to-day -day jobs to attend learning session meetings. That's for the core team to do. The core team has the obligation to keep the expanded team informed about what they learned, but it's really useful to have both. And you know what's missing here? Patients and families on these teams. So think about how you might integrate a patient who survived sepsis or a patient that didn't convert to severe sepsis because it was caught early, um, or a family And you could even have um, a family member of a patient that died, that did not survive the event, if that family member is willing to make this kind of a contribution and commitment. So don't forget about putting families and patients on the team. And then managers and directors and the leaders in the organization, they have one job to do in spread and that is barrier removal because only they have the stroke of the pen ability to remove these systemic barriers that get in the way of improvement and spread. And don't forget about oversight and that would be the, the team of high-level clinical experts who are knowledgeable about sepsis. And you will also have some sort of a stakeholder team and you think about the community resources that you might need or other community facilities like long-term care facilities or nursing homes where people might develop sepsis. So you may want to have a broader um, stakeholder team. And then the leadership group, and I think about the leadership group as nesting bowls. So we have senior leadership, but there may need to be a leadership group who is tasked with the responsibility of spread and creating the kind of cooperation among professionals and departments that's needed for a successful spread effort. So how is it that you should be adding your spread units? I suggest, and it's suggested in the lessons learned from Ghana, that you develop a criteria for adding each spread unit. And then each spread facility if you're crossing an, um, hospitals, you're part of a system. So you have the criteria. So the criteria might be a willingness to experiment, it, our criteria might be we have more patients than others that are likely to become septic. So you, you decide on your own criteria. And then before these spread units, join the effort. So you've launched your learning collaborative and you're six months into it and you've already identified who your first spread recipients will be. You want to start collecting baseline data for those six units. And there's two reasons for that. One so they can see where they are and it helps them set their goal for uh, um, their outcomes and their process measures on their unit but also it gives them an idea of what's possible and it prevents them joining and they haven't figured out how to collect data yet because sometimes there's a lag between teams joining when they figure out data collection and what we want to do is um, get in front of that lag. So if a team has to collect data, a unit has to collect data for six months before they start, they've got all the issues around data collection sorted out before they join the spread effort. So with the addition of each five units or each five sites, you have to design a way for these five sites to join the learning community or the learning collaborative. That, and then when they join, they're going to stay in for 12 to 18 months. So there needs to be some thought about how they get oriented, how they get brought into the fold, and how they get um, trained. So as each set of the five enter, they will join the learning community. And then as the learning community progresses, it's really important to begin to refine your change package and driver diagrams. These are the good ideas ready for use, the changes that we have organized in a learning community 
that users know that if they take these changes and learn how to put them in place, they'll get results. And usually we start off with a broad change package with a lot of ideas, but as a learning community matures, we discover what the vital few changes are, the really high leverage changes. So part of the job of the, those running the learning community is to refine the change package and driver diagram as you go so that the next onboarding site, spread site, know which are the highest leverage changes that will get me results. And they can therefore um, accelerate achieving results because they're only going to use the high leverage changes. And they continue with data collection. So just because I've rung the bell or I've achieved my results doesn't mean I stop collecting data because I need to know if I've sustained my gains. And then as the units come on, they've collected six months of baseline data and they continue to collect data. So in the Fives Alive um, project document, Lessons Learned, they have this diagram. And this diagram shows that you have your health facilities or your spread units on the left. And um, they have an ass assessment and design period where they're uh, learning about how they do the care now. The first learning session happens in the learning network. And that there's usually three or more learning sessions over the 12 to 24, 18 months of your um, network. But during this time, um, there's peer-to-peer -peer learning. Try and minimize the lecture, but foster the um, learning by doing and learning from each other, so the shared learning. Uh, the model for improvement is used throughout the um, learning network time, and there is some planning around the sequence of changes. We highly recommend that you add site visits to um, the action period. So site visits to successful units and successful facilities. And even if you're in a multi-facility um, collaborative, you may even go to facilities that aren't even in your system but who are doing a particularly good job. So site visits do two things. The visitors learn, but also the hosts in getting ready um, have to shore up their learning and um, prepare for the visit, and that also helps them make their improvements. So just a word about this network uh, learning community planning. At the first learning session, it's good to have teams do a root cause analysis and identify what are the gaps and what are the problems in our system around sepsis, our lack of response, our lack of screening, and um, our ability to reduce mortality. And then at the first learning session, make sure that every spread unit or every unit that is there agree and commit to at least, and I say at least, one of the big change ideas from the driver diagram that they're going to work on. And when they leave that learning session, they know what the next four changes are they're going to test. I don't think one big change is enough. I would urge them, a team, to, to come up with the next one or two big changes that they're going to make, and four changes related to each one of those. They will be guided and learn about the model for improvement and the use of PDSA, so that has to also be covered in the learning sessions. And then the content around how to make those um, changes work. At the second learning session, you're beginning to harvest the best ideas that worked from the work of the first group in the first action period after the learning session. At the second learning session, it's really all teach, all learn. It's much more peer teaching. The peers become each other's internal experts. And the model for improvement continues to be used, stressing techniques to accelerate improvement, how, uh, what are the steps for implementation, and what needs to be done to assure sustainability and to use data to assess sustainability. And again, those site visits, I can't stress the importance of the site visits. I just wanted to remind you about the model for improvement, and it's three questions. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that it changes an improvement? That's where data comes in. What are the changes we need to make that will result in improvement, and how do we harvest those to make sure we get the highest leverage changes possible so that every spread unit can take those vital few changes and run them through the plan, do, study, act cycle over and over again until they learn how to implement those changes on their unit. So in the PDSA cycle, we start with a plan. What will happen if we try something different? We try it. 
Did it work? That's the study. And what should we do next? So there's some predictable challenges that happen as you do a spread project. And one is in the beginning, there'll be a lot of skepticism about quality improvement. So having some ways to respond to that is important. You might want to have a few articles up your sleeve or some great results from other projects to share. The amount of support that the initial units need during scale up uh, can't be underestimated. And they will become mentors and teachers to others, but they also need your support, your leadership support. They still need to be the object of your curiosity. You still need to go there and ask, how's it going? Are you holding your gains? How do you know you're holding your gains? By the way, how much money have you saved? What's happened to the average length of stay? Tell me about the last person you rescued. So in summary, select and stage your spread units and sites. Make sure you form improvement teams and develop deep and wide improvement know-how. Use a learning network or collaborative as a structure. And I want to just say a word about this deep and wide improvement know-how. Not everyone in the organization needs a year-long program in becoming an improvement advisor. But you do need to have some experts in your facilities that are, have very deep knowledge in improvement science. And the managers of the units need to have enough knowledge that they can lead an improvement project and troubleshoot an improvement project and collect data. And then staff, and that would be your extended team and as many staff as you can train, all they need are the tools and techniques of improvement. They don't need to understand the philosophy and the deeper uh, parts of the science, but they do need to have the tools and have enough training that they can use them and everyone needs to be versed in PDSA. And then leaders need special training, and that's around how to link improvement to strategic initiatives and how to demonstrate their ambition, their curiosity, and their commitment, and how to manage a portfolio of improvement. And then finally, I want to close by saying site visits, site visits, site visits. Make sure that you uh, conduct your site visits. And I think you'll find, if you follow the tips um, that we've given you today, and really develop the quality improvement capability, your spread will be successful. Thank you.